good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is Harrison Smith with another episode of Cinema, and it is brought to you by Dark Matter TV. Episode 90 is a kind of quasi part two to episode 89, uh, where I followed up after seeing Godzilla vs. Kong in the uh, theater. And what prompted this was I made a post somewhere uh, about my thoughts on Godzilla vs. Kong and uh, how I really felt let down by a number of things on the film. Uh, one of them being that to me and to people around me sitting in the theater who I overheard talking, the film very clearly uh, was heavily edited and seems that there is just a massive amount of information that was chopped out of this movie or never shot. And then later on over the weekend after opening weekend, it was uh, clear to find that indeed Adam Wingard uh, confirmed that there could be at least a five-hour cut of Godzilla vs. Kong. Now, I'm not asking for a five-hour cut. What I'm saying is it was very clear that an incredible amount of information and plot and, and also character development was sliced out of this just to get to the goods. And it brings us back to the, it seems to be like this age old uh, debate with monster movies. And that is, uh, you know, well, should there really be uh, so much of a human element or, or a human presence involved after all these are monster movies? Well, I got a post very similar to that from a friend after I posted my thoughts who said, you know, something along the line of, you know, not to be the curmudgeon here or anything, but isn't that what it's all about? Isn't it about going to see a movie to watch giant monsters fight? And the answer is, yeah, and also, no. Because it's not all about the crash and boom. There has to be a human element here, a story. And that human element is to enhance the overall plot. It's about the people, it's about the characters. I mean, look at it this way. Why, in my opinion, has Star Wars in that, why have they all stumbled? And the, and the number one problem that you can really look at with Disney's Star Wars saga is, is the inability to have really good uh, characters, human characters. It's not all about the spaceships shooting each other and the explosions or even the lightsaber battles or, or whatever. Again, it's about the characters. When it became less about the people and more about the crash and boom, we saw a huge explosion in the dissatisfaction of franchises, and we can go all the way through that. Was I'll name them. Star Trek, Star Wars, even all the Marvel stuff. When you start reducing the human element out of these stories, all it is is crash and boom. And I'm going to get to that later. This also comes from people who, I'm going to say it, they, they don't understand monster movies. They don't get why we watch monster movies. It's not all about sitting around watching people in rubber and latex suits step on you know plaster buildings and plastic buildings. That's not why I watched them as a kid. Yes, I loved watching the fights. I loved watching uh, the cities get trashed, but I always paid attention to the human element. And I'm gonna get to that coming up. I mean, let's first, let's look at Alien, the Alien franchise. I mean, for me, and I think most of you, the stumble with the franchise came with Alien 3, when a focus shifted to the monster. And this has continued because uh, you can go back and look at all of this stuff in the way of David Fincher, you know, his original vision for Alien 3 and what we got. The underlying problem has always been is that the studio wanted more Alien. And by changing the story, whether you like the idea that they killed Newt or not and what they did with Ripley at the end of it, the, the point is the focus should be on the people. And this is exactly what made Alien and Aliens work so well. It was the human drama. In fact, the enhanced cut of James Cameron's Aliens even gives us more to sink our teeth into when we start to realize that Sigourney Weaver's attachment to Newt stems from the death of her own daughter while she was asleep for all those decades out in space. Now, Prometheus tried to reverse some of this, but then it all turned back to a focus on the monster. I mean, Covenant was all about that. Look, they they tried. They tried to bring in the human element, but again, part of that also was a lot of pandering to the PC element too. And audiences are far more sophisticated now. Look, back in the 1950s, when you went to go see an alien or monster movie, 
Uh, it was just basically to go see that. There wasn't a lot of you know deep human drama on on a lot of these you know space and alien kind of movies. But there was something there. We did care enough about all of this. Otherwise, why would we have it? Just get rid of it, jettison it. Look, this is why we took Bill Paxton's death so hard when he died. It wasn't, it was because what, what were people saying on Twitter and online? Game over, man. Game over. We remember Hudson. We remember his character. We got into these characters. The function of the human story is to serve as the voices for the monsters. The response of their monster movies, you, you don't need human characters, come from people who don't watch or understand monster movies. And I will absolutely take the opportunity to sound monster or even kaiju elitist here, because it's true. It's like people saying that, you know, uh, recently we just had this, I think it was a deliberate dust up just to get interactions. Uh, but some woman on Twitter, a, a reporter, somebody like that, I don't know who she was. It doesn't matter. She's got a blue check mark, but what does that mean anymore? And uh, she said something like she refuses to believe that horror can be set in space. And and quite frankly, that's it's like saying again, okay, I'll, I'll raise you that. I'll see you and raise you. Well, women aren't funny. How about that? Okay, so female stand-up comedians and all that, they're not funny. I don't believe that. I'm just saying that I think this was a phrase, that, a, a statement that she put out there just to trigger people and get interactions on her account. It's a ridiculous thing to say. It, it's no different than just this morning I was on Twitter and somebody tweeted that they were very upset because uh, someone had told them that The Shining wasn't really a horror movie because it wasn't really well adapted from King's original source material. What a stupid thing to say. And that tells me that you really just don't understand horror. But even further, you don't understand film. So let's get back on track with monsters. Look, growing up, I loved the TV series Ultraman. Now, it was shot years before I was born, but it didn't matter. I loved all of the characters. Yes, I loved watching the monsters step on the buildings. And, and quite frankly, it's the same shit every episode. You know, you have your, your monster crisis, the science patrol steps in, Ultraman comes, saves the day, monster defeated, moving on to the next episode. But here's the thing. We liked those human characters as kids. I loved Hayata. I wanted the beta capsule. I wanted the Science Patrol to win, and that's why to this day, after 40 years later, I can still cite all of their names off the top of my head, and I'll do it now. There's Captain Mura, Ito, Fuji, Arashi, and of course, Hayata. And the reason why is because the human element was absolutely 100% important to big monster movie, big monster step on city. Back to Godzilla. I guess talking about Godzilla vs. Kong and its major human problems, it's it's not a review of the film, but I want to talk about this, this growing uh, desire now for people, like you're hearing it more and more online, to just reduce or jettison the human stories altogether. So let's look back at King of the Monsters and the human problems there. I mean, number one, we had too many characters. And we had a Millie Bobby Brown subplot that went absolutely nowhere. Millie Bobby Brown was there to bring in the Stranger Things crowd. And, and the script writing on these characters, I mean, the big problem was you had just too many villains. You had too much of everything going on. And with Millie Bobby Brown, if you're going to have this girl bond with Godzilla, then fucking do it. Don't skirt, don't hedge, don't go around it all, and don't give the family melodrama of a, of a dead sibling like we opened with, and that's supposed to generate all of this, that that turned Vera Farmia into, you know, a, a quasi-conflicted villain. All of this stuff, it was way too much. And Sarah Zawa himself, Dr. Sarah Zawa, that's what the movie should have focused on. They didn't focus on him enough in the 2014 film. This was a chance to really expand him. And I know what you're saying. Well, they really did. They really showed more of his relationship. Yeah, and then they killed him. You just went through all this trouble to flesh him out a little more. Then you get rid of, which in my opinion, was the most engaging character of this new monster verse, And you dispense with him in, in two movies. Sarah Zawa, even back to the original 1954 film, which was part of the Showa series, 
It was Dr. Sarazawa who was tortured and conflicted with this oxygen destroyer weapon, and he knew that he had a dark past with his involvement in World War II with the Japanese Empire and the Nazis, and he also understood the power of the weapon that he had developed. While it was supposed to be a weapon, it turns out that while this can save mankind from Godzilla, the secret is so terrible it can never be allowed to disseminate, and Sarazawa perishes with the monster at the end of the 1954 film. Sarazawa was as haunted in 1954 as he is throughout the MonsterVerse. I mean, we make it very clear uh, when you watch the MonsterVerse films in 2014 that he carries his father's pocket watch that stopped at the moment that the Hiroshima bomb was detonated. In the original series, Sarazawa was part of the war effort. And he dealt with the Nazis, as I had said, and, and after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he knew he was the monster for inventing the oxygen destroyer. Sarazawa is tied to Godzilla in the original 1950s film just as much as Dr. Sarazawa in the 2014 Monsterverse is as well. The Monsterverse was built on all of this, providing us with the best monster-human relationship, which inexplicably ended in King of the Monsters. I said this in my previous podcast on Godzilla vs. Cinema, which I believe is episode four. That was the deep human moment when Sarazawa had to manually detonate the bomb to save Godzilla, to jumpstart him, and went up and touched the beast on its face and just said, goodbye, old friend. That was a great tear, teary-eyed moment in the theater. I watched other people wiping tears. It is a terrific moment in the film and we just don't have enough of this throughout this monster verse and granted we did not have enough of it in the showa series it was clear that kyle chandler was the heir to sarazawa in king of the monsters and yet in godzilla versus kong he's given nothing kyle chandler is barely in this film i i think he makes like a pop-up in the opening uh, they, they sprinkle him in the middle and then he shows up at the very end to throw some wise-ass ha-ha remark. And that's really it. Monarch, the human story, Monarch is the human story. And they reduced Monarch to be a non-player in this whole thing when that's what started all of this in the MonsterVerse in 2014. So is it all about big monsters crashing about and fighting? And, and if so, what separates this from Transformers or just making one gigantic video game? Look, I've played the Godzilla games for Xbox and PlayStation, and Godzilla vs. Kong is not much more than those. Go back to the original films from 1954 to 1995. That is the Showa series, or Showa series, however you want to pronounce it. Sarazawa is the only standout human character out of that entire series from 1954 to 1975, I believe is when it ended with the terror of Mecha Godzilla. 1985 through 1995 gave us the whole brand new series known as the Heisei series. And I'm probably butchering that and mispronouncing it as well. But that was all of the new films from 1984. It was not Godzilla 1985. That's what we called it in America. It was from 1984 with the return of Godzilla all the way through to Godzilla versus Destroya. The human story next to the 1954 original Godzilla is perhaps best used in Monster Zero with the American crossover with Nick Adams in the film. The human story also played a little bit better in the original Godzilla vs. Kong, uh, going or King Kong vs. Godzilla back in 1963 with the whole media owner who was kind of this goofy, wacky kind of Japanese guy. Uh, he was a promoter, all of that. He, he really wanted to, to seek uh, the, the media on, on getting Godzilla and Kong teamed up and exploit that. And, and I remember that guy. I can't tell you his name. And I can remember the two brothers uh, that were in the film too. And, and they had to, uh, you know, figure out a way to use the berry juice to knock out Kong and, and all of this stuff and then pair him and Godzilla up to kind of cancel each other out on Mount Fuji. I mean, I remember those guys, but I don't really remember their names. And I can't remember even as a boy being emotionally moved. I wasn't emotionally vested when Kong grabbed the girl in the original King Kong versus Godzilla. I, I wasn't vested in any of this. But then you move in to the 1984 on series, 84, 85, moving all the way through. And in Godzilla versus Biollante, 
they they actually created a really good human interface. A girl, a psychic girl named Mickey Saigusa. And, and again, I pr- apologize if I've mispronounced that name. Godzilla vs. Biolanti is, is a lackluster film. I mean, for those of you who don't know, uh, Godzilla vs. Biolanti was created out of a contest. Toho ran a contest to uh, look for a new monster villain. And I believe it was a dentist came up with Biolanti. And uh, they resurrected Godzilla in that film from his drop in the volcano from the original film, whether you saw Godzilla 1985 with Raymond Burr or the full Japanese version of Godzilla 1984, the return of Godzilla. Um, uh, Godzilla is woken up and he is removed. Uh, he comes out of uh, the terrace, I believe these terrorists detonate some bombs and Godzilla is freed uh, from the volcano. And his touchstone becomes Mickey. Mickey has a psychic bond with Godzilla. And that extends all the way through until the end of the Heisei series where it would be uh, Godzilla handed off to the Americans for the abysmal 1998 film. Now look, I'm, I'm not saying that this is high drama and I'm not looking for high drama. Mickey gave a human voice to Godzilla, which made us root for him even more. We got a good shot at human writing with the Japanese veteran in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, if you remember that as well, too. Let's let's go back to that one. If, if you remember in the in the Heisei series, if you have not seen these, um, these are full 100% Japanese Godzilla films. And I think this one came out around 93, 94, somewhere there, 93 maybe. Um, we look at the origins of Godzilla, and he was on this island, and he was known as a Godzillasaurus. And during World War II, uh, he was kind of protecting the Japanese army on this island from the Americans. And then uh, he was killed by the Americans and left to die on the beach. But the captain, the leader of that Japanese platoon, bonded with Godzilla. And, and he had a connection with him. And I can't remember his name, but I can say that I remember being moved by him and the Japanese soldiers taking off their hats in respect to the dying dinosaur lying on the beach. Then Godzilla will be transformed into a nuclear beast and resurrected. And then, of course, these two characters will meet up again all those years later. But it worked. It was a good human story. And that's what really mattered. Like You just can't have scene after scene of monster and monster and monster and monster. And, and the sad part is, the reason why I'm doing this episode today is because that's exactly what it seems people are asking for. And I just don't understand it. The humans represent Japan's torment in all of these Godzilla films, especially Sarazawa and even Mickey. Godzilla is often seen as a punisher, but he's also a redeemer as we will find out in the final film of the Heisei series, Godzilla vs. Destroya. And in that film, it was Mickey who allows the audience to understand what is going on, that Birth Island was destroyed, that Junior Godzilla is missing, but she has a psychic connection to Junior Godzilla as well, too. And, And Junior Godzilla is going to take the place eventually of his father. It is Mickey who provides and fills in, I should say, all of the gaps that really all this crash and boom cannot do. You can just sit there and watch all this and you still don't get anything. You don't connect with it. And Mickey allows us to connect with the monsters. At the very end, even though I guess if you go back and do an edit and cut Mickey out of the ending of Godzilla vs. Destroya, at the end when she takes off her hat and she says, you know, goodbye to him as Godzilla is melting down and dying in that one, it is absolutely a solemn moment. And when you provide that with, with Ifakubi's score, it is an incredibly powerful moment. And it shows just what can happen when you write the human story well and get it involved and interfaced well with the monster story. In Godzilla vs. Kong, only that wonderful little girl who plays Gia gives us anything close to this. And really... The relationship that Gia has with Kong in Godzilla vs. Kong is far more potent, aside from Dr. Sarazawa, than any of the human connections in the previous MonsterVerse films. Gia's mute and deaf little girl is our only human investment in an otherwise heavily edited, get-to-the-goods monster mashing of Godzilla vs. Kong. 
Look, since the inception of 2014's Godzilla, we have no steady or consistent human contact, but we should. And aside from Dr. Sarah Zawa, it should have been Dr. Houston Brooks. Hollywood screams diversity. And aside from Dr. Sarah Zawa, when it comes time to leave Godzilla in human hands, they hand him off to Kyle Chandler, and then they do absolutely fucking nothing with Kyle Chandler in Godzilla vs. Kong. Explain this, please. Tell me the logic behind this. Well, I think I can tell you the logic behind this, and I'm going to get to that momentarily. Dr. Brooks was given next to nothing to do in King of the Monsters. I mean, you could blink and you're going to miss him. He's in Mothra's scene when she hatches, and that's really about it. And yet he was established in Monarch going back to Skull Island. So let me divert now to Skull Island. Like I said, by far, it has the best human characters of all all the MonsterVerse films. It struck the right balance. Samuel L. Jackson's character is as haunted by war as Dr. Sarazawa was. While Riley's character uh, befriends and respects Kong after the island provided friendship between two warring men, Jackson, however, is angry, defeated, and the last of his kind, like Kong. And John Goodman's character represents the whole I don't trust the government motif. But Monarch was established to preserve, to understand, to study. This is very, very clear. In the opening of King of the Monsters, it is Monarch. Monarch brings balance to the human monster condition. It is Monarch going before Congress and saying, you can't just arbitrarily, unilaterally wipe out these things. We need to study them. We need to understand what they do, why they do, why they've shown up. Is there something wrong with us? That's Monarch's job. And in Godzilla vs. Kong, it all goes away. Monarch, most people probably wouldn't even be able to tell you where and when Monarch was even invoked or mentioned other than when you see Kyle Chandler and the only job that Monarch has in that movie is to stand around and watch shit get all messed up on video monitors. After a solid congressional scene, that scene in King of the Monsters, the human characters devolved into a PC cast that were spouting out one-liners and given zero to do. There are so many people in Godzilla King of the Monsters I can't even name them all. I know that a lot of them love to, you know, crack wise and throw out one-liners and we have to make sure that we've represented everybody across the board. And what are we doing with Millie Bobby Brown? What really was she there to do other than play the Greek chorus for her mother and, you know, give the lines, this isn't going to bring him back. So that was really it. We have an after-school special with a monster movie. And, and let's go a little further. Admiral Stenz, David Strathern's Admiral Stenz in both... 2014 and in King of the Monsters. In 2014, David Strathern's Admiral Stenz had absolutely nothing to do except be the bad voice, the, the wet blanket to Dr. Sarazawa. He was the guy that was always watching the clock and saying, you know what, if you don't get this shit done, I'm going to have to break out the nukes, just so you know. He was the typical military guy. And there is a dreadful scene in the 2014 film, which they actually used when they went to release the film beforehand as uh, one of those clips, like a little teaser clip to give you, uh, they, they showed this scene and it's Admiral Stenz walking on the bridge of this uh, aircraft carrier and he's talking all this exposition. He's saying how the Mutos, uh, uh, the one Muto has become airborne and the other one's being tracked to Las Vegas and blah, 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 blah. And we are not going to give up. We are going to keep this from the public. And while I'm watching this, I remember it was an uh-oh moment for me for the 2014 film. It was like bad dialogue 101. And it, watching it, I'm like, I even went back and watched it again. And I said, who the hell is this guy talking to? Go look at the scene. I'll provide a link to it in my show notes. Just who the hell is he talking to? Nobody on the bridge is paying any attention to him. There are no media there. Who is he speaking to? There are no doctors there to get a report like Sarah Zawa. Nobody's there. Who is Admiral Stenz pontificating to? And I can tell you, it's to us, the audience. It's called exposition. And the number one rule in screenwriting always is show it. Don't tell it. And that scene is an example of what not to do. I'll provide the link in my show notes. 
And then we go over to King of the Monsters where Sten shows up briefly in the beginning to be kind of like, well, just so you know, we might have to kill these things. I'm, I'm back to be the doomsayer. And then in addition to that, he shows up maybe halfway through the film just when Godzilla is about to kill Ghidorah and nobody's listening to Dr. Sarazawa whatsoever. Then uh, Sten shows up to say, well, we have this thing called an oxygen destroyer. Just so you know, we've been working on it and we're going to launch this thing. What? Where did this come from? Nobody mentioned it in the 2014 film and no one was talking about it beforehand. It was just one of those things like, well, we got to shoe in this oxygen destroyer thing. Let's get that in there. And then they launch it. It almost kills Godzilla. And then it's never talked of again. And it's certainly not used in uh, Godzilla versus Kong. I mean, look, why build Mecha Godzilla? If you want to kill Godzilla, just get the fucking technology of the oxygen destroyer. Because if it wasn't for Dr. Sarazawa and Mothra, Godzilla would have died. The oxygen destroyer worked in King of the Monsters. So I, I won't even get into the whole stupidity of the mecha thing. I've always felt it was dumb. I always felt that it geared right to the lowest common denominator for children. That was when the series, the original Showa series, was going off the rails and it was like, we're running out of ideas, so let's just throw in these giant robot monsters. That should make things better and more interesting. Back to Skull Island for a moment. Kong Skull Island gave us solid human interfaces, which brought out the seriousness to the film. We identified with Shea Wiggum. Remember him when he sacrificed himself for his platoon? Uh, he pulled out the grenades and he stood there as the skull crusher was coming after him and he was going to detonate this stuff in his mouth and then the monster just flicked him away. I was in a theatrical audience where people went, oh no! And then when he blows up on the cliff, there was even a chuckle. Look, we got... We got amusement out of these human characters. It was important. Even John C. Riley's return to civilization at the end was touching. We identified with him when he came home to his wife, and we wished we could have seen the things he did. And in the end, Riley got what Kong never would. Riley got his family back. So many human themes established in this film, and some touched upon in King of the Monsters, but then we have to layer on the bad guys, the bad companies, the villains, and like Batman Returns and on, too many villains spoil the film. I mean, go back to 2014. We had a solid, identifiable character with Brian Cranston's Brody. We felt for him. We understood his loss in that truly wrenching scene where he loses his wife to the radioactive steam. He becomes a man obsessed and not with Godzilla. He doesn't even really know about Godzilla. It was a Muto that attacked that nuclear power plant. His demands to know what is going on as to what killed his wife echoes every person's frustration with the government and the incessant need to keep things secret. But then you got Kickass's character, Aaron Taylor Johnson. I mean, it's supposed to be a hero's journey for this kid. Cranston is taken from us about, what, 20 minutes in? after they marketed the movie looking like it's, it's a Brian Cranston starring motion picture. In fact, a guy sitting next to me in the original 2014 Godzilla said as they were zipping up Brian Cranston's body bag and the camera went to Aaron Taylor Johnson, he said, we're left with this fucking guy. I mean, I didn't care about Johnson. I didn't care about his kid or his wife at home. Why, why do I care about them? Because they were given absolutely nothing to do. We ended up with a lackluster human story exemplified again by that terrible Admiral Sten's exposition talk on that aircraft carrier. I mean, again, why did they do that? To save money on the effects? We're just going to say, well, this thing sprouted wings and it's flying. We don't have to show it. I mean, I don't know. What connection did Kickass have to his father? His journey makes him no different than when he started. Aaron Taylor Johnson's soldier is no different than when the movie started, when he shows up at the end in the stadium. Does he share a connection with Godzilla? I mean, we do see that for a moment, both collapsed at the end from exhaustion, but then again, nothing. And he never shows up again. I mean, I get it. There are other stories out there in the MonsterVerse, but no human stories are resonating. Kong Skull Island worked the human story best. Great effort was set up in 2014's Godzilla King of the Monsters, however, to establish Monarch as this global entity watching all this weird shit going on. Great effort was set up in 2014's Godzilla 
to establish Monarch as this global entity watching the weird shit going on. And you have an opportunity here to really make some great characters that run Monarch. Really cool stuff. But then it becomes diminished in King of the Monsters. But Skull Island showed us Monarch was very influential and powerful in the 70s. It was Goodman who gave that film its gravitas and drew us into the narrative, as did Jackson and Riley. A solid balance of human story and monsters gave Skull Island much needed depth. Sadly, this was all reversed in King of the Monsters. The problem, once again, too many villains. That also goes for the monsters. Look, Ghidorah is Godzilla's Joker. If Godzilla were Batman, Ghidorah is the Joker. Ghidorah is the ultimate enemy. The same goes for Charles Dance's Alan Jonah, who, who gets a lot of screen time built up as this geriatric eco like Che Guevara, only to take a backseat to Vera Farmiga's conflicted eco-villain scientist and, and eventually to be erased altogether in Godzilla vs. Kong. We never find out what happened to Alan Jonah. We did all of this stuff in King of the Monsters and there's just no mention of him. Now, maybe there is in another cut, but the cut that I saw in theaters, there was nothing there. Too many characters, ladies and gentlemen. Too many people jockeying for position against a backdrop of governmental conspiracy, hollow earth nonsense, and techno babble that all got mixed up in too dark a shots in King of the Monster and lots of bad viewpoints through technology. That was uh, King of the Monster's biggest problem. Dr. Sarazawa in that film should have been pitted directly against Alan Jonah. Instead, we have Jonah chewing scenery, echoing his Game of Thrones king, and not really doing much of anything else. Jonah should have been Khan to Sarazawa's Kirk, with Godzilla the center of their fight. Instead, it was thrown all over, and when Sarazawa goes through the trouble to, to hand his life's work over to Kyle Chandler, this is all thrown out the window in Godzilla vs. Kong. No mention of Jonah, as I said. A new tech villain is introduced who remind me of Al Pacino and Scarface and, and lots of techno bullshit and characters that amounted to nothing. And again, overall, the stupid subplot of the giant robot cyborg monster. So let me get to the point of this episode. Here's the danger of it all. We are conditioning audiences to accept the dumbed down lowest common denominator in our entertainment. Godzilla was never about the monster. The original 1954 film was clear. Man made the monster. We are the monsters. And all of this is lost as the monster verse advances. As I said, Adam Wingard states Godzilla vs. Kong is his director cut, the one we saw in theaters. It's his vision. I don't believe that. He said that indeed he has this, that a five hour cut could be made. That tells me there's a whole other story out. I think the studio came in using the pandemic as an excuse to chop the living shit out of Godzilla vs. Kong and reduce it to a video game style film, which would delight the first few weekends and ultimately be forgotten. The goal was to get the money back, and after King of the Monsters perceived underperformance, Godzilla vs. Kong was the natural target to hinge the entire Monsterverse upon. No mistakes could be made. Wingard goes ahead and shoots a lot of human story to intertwine everything with what might have been a layered monster movie. The studio uses the pandemic, in my opinion, to quietly re-edit the movie to ensure it gets in under two hours and gets to the monster mashing goods. Look, I saw early reviews of Godzilla vs. Kong over a year ago from uh, sneak previews and screenings, and the reviews were issuing some plot points that do not match the theatrical cut whatsoever. One of the biggest was, is that the monsters, you have to wait an hour for the monsters to meet. That is not the case if you've seen Godzilla vs. Kong. It happens pretty quickly. This opens the door for excusing laziness. Aren't we there just to see the monsters fight? Okay, then apply this logic to superhero movies. Make one two-hour film of nothing but fights. No dialogue, just lots of aerial, laser-zapping, building-crushing fights for a full 120 minutes. That's it. Uh, excuse me, didn't we pay to watch superheroes fight and smash shit up? No! What makes you love whether it's DC or Marvel, or when you read comics as a kid. Did you read the comics and actually love the fight scenes? Or did you love the drama and the human story that led up to them? Or 
Should we just have endless space battles in Star Wars or Star Trek? I mean, imagine Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, becoming nothing more than just two hours of the Enterprise and the Reliant firing on each other, or just Kirk and Khan in endless, unending hand-to-hand -hand combat, or just firing laser guns at each other. Two hours of that. Excuse me, didn't we pay to watch spaceships fight and blow up? Perhaps the ending lightsaber fight in the conclusion of The Phantom Menace Make that a full two hours. Let's just have a full two straight hours of endless lightsaber fighting. No real dialogue, no character or plot development, no real human development. Just give me technology and let the technology fight. Now, of course, people will say, no, Harrison, that's different. No, it's not. Hell, even porn connoisseurs want some kind of plot to their sex stories. Jaws is not a shark story. Without the well-written human stories behind those characters, Jaws becomes Jaws the Revenge. But excuse me, didn't we pay to see a shark eat people? Go ahead then, go watch Jaws the Revenge. Go watch any of the cheap CGI shark knockoffs then. The best horror circles back not to just the monster, but the best human characters as well. This is why Halloween always goes back to Jamie Lee Curtis. It's the people. That's why A Nightmare on Elm Street realize it's screwed up by not bringing Nancy back for A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 and quickly brought her back for Part 3. And there's no coincidence, folks, as to why Part 3 went through the box office on opening weekend. People came back for Nancy. They saw a return to the human story, not just Freddy cutting people up. I mean, you want a film where all it is is Michael Myers walking around killing people? Tell me how well that would work because... Excuse me, didn't we just pay to see the killer kill people? Film is not one size fits all. Godzilla vs. Kong succumbs to the human factor instead of trying the much harder aspect of making it all work and supplementing a monster movie. Make no mistake, as I said in the opening of this, I love watching monsters smash buildings, but I don't want two straight hours of it. Look, the ending to The Man of Steel, go back to superheroes for a moment, was bereft of any real human drama. A giant video game of Cavill and, and Shannon smashing shit up. I had a headache by the end of that movie, literally. The original Superman's love and charm were its human characters. When Glenn Ford died on that driveway, every single person who knew the pain of losing a parent was right there with Clark at the graveside in a simple, quiet scene. And there really aren't any quiet moments in Godzilla vs. Kong. Gia, the only character who in many respects emulates Mickey from the Heisei series of Godzilla films, she has a genuine bond with Kong that gives us Kong's heart and noble intentions. Gia is the one who conveys his fear, his loneliness. She makes Kong more relatable to the audience. Humans serve as the interface for the monsters to give the audience something more. This has not been the case throughout this entire Godzilla series. The Showa series is a prime example. Like I said, from the, aside from the original 1954 film, the Showa series is uneven at best in its human characters. I mean, again, name any standout aside from Dr. Sarazawa or Nick Adams' Glenn from Monster Zero. And that's because he's the only American in that series, in the Showa series, given star billing. But we like Glenn. We rooted for him and his astronaut buddy to, to kick some Planet X ass, and we're fighting the aliens really alongside Godzilla and Rodan as they took on Ghidorah. So let's reduce all films across the board to their lowest common denominator, shall we? Whatever genre, boil it down to the streaming way of watching a movie. Skip every 10 seconds just to get to the good stuff. That's the way we should do it, right? Skip character and plot development, skip good dialogue, skip emotional attachment. Let's do what the rest of the world seems set on doing. Focus on the superficial, the base, and the dumb, and lower that bar even further. So for those of you listening to this episode, I am sorry. I'll record my episodes in the future by getting right to the point without any facts and development to support my case. One sentence should about do it. So stand by for episode 91. Thank you.